Seven Secrets of the Goddess by Devdutt Patanayak. Chapter 1 Gaia's Secret Male Anxiety is Outdated. Part 1 Gaia is the Earth Mother in Greek mythology. Her mate Uranus, the starry sky, clung to her intimately and gave her no space. The only way her son, Cronus, could leave Gaia's womb was by castrating his father. From the blood drops arose Aphrodite, goddess of love, and the Erinys, the goddesses of retribution, who were fiercely protective of the mother. Cronus then declared himself king, and to the horror of the Gaia, ate his own children to prevent them from overpowering him as he overpowered his father. Gaia saves one son, Zeus, from the brutality of Cronus, raises him in secret and eventually Zeus attacks and kills Cronus. In triumph, Zeus declares himself father of gods of men, takes residence atop Mount Olympus that reaches into the sky. Gaia remains the Earth Mother, respected but distant. This idea of a primal female deity first adored, then brutally sidelined by a male deity is a consistent theme in mythologies around the world. The Inuit, Eskimo tribes of the Arctic region, tell the story of one Sedna, who, unhappy with her marriage to a seagull, begs her father to take her back home in his boat. But as they make their way, they are attacked by a flock of seagulls. To save himself, Sedna's father casts her overboard. When she tries to climb back, he cuts off her fingers. As she struggles to get back in with her mutilated hands, he cuts her arms too. So she sinks to the bottom of the ocean, her dismembered limbs transforming into fish, seals, whales and all of the other sea mammals. Those who wish to hunt her children for food need to appease her through shamans who speak soothing words. The Tantric tradition of India speaks of the primal one, Adya, who took the form of a bird and laid three unfertilized eggs from which were born Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Adya then sought to unite with the three male gods. Brahma refused as he saw Adya as his mother. Adya cursed him that there will be no temples in his honor. Adya found Vishnu too shifty and shrewd, so she turned to the rather stern Shiva who advised by Vishnu, agreed to be her lover provided she gave him her third eye. She did and he used it to release a missile of fire that set her aflame and turned her into ash. From the ash came three goddesses, Saraswati, Lakshmi and Gauri, who became wives of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. Also from the ash came the Grama Devis, goddesses of every human settlement. Egyptian mythology acknowledges a time before gender. Then there was Atum, the great He-She, who brought forth the god of air, Shu, and the goddess of dew, Tefnut, who separated Geb, the earth god, from Nut, the sky goddess, who gave birth to Isis and Osiris, the first queen and king of human civilization. Then Seth killed Osiris and declared himself king until Isis gave birth to Horus and contested his claim. In these stories from around the world, the male deities compete for the female prize. This can be traced to nature, where all wombs are precious, but not all sperms. So the males have to compete for the female. In many bird species, the female chooses the male with the most colorful feathers, the best voice or the best song or with the capability of building the best nest. In many animal species, such as the walrus and the lion, the alpha male keeps all the females for himself. Thus, there are always remainder males who do not get the female. This selection of only the best males creates anxiety amongst the not-so-good males and translates into the fear of invalidation in the human species. To cope with this fear of invalidation, Social structures such as marriage laws and inheritance rights come into being, often at the cost of the female. As human society learn to domesticate animals and plants, trade and build cities, we see a gradual shift in social laws, deterioration in the status of women and rejection of goddess worship in favor of god worship.
After thousands of years as hunter-gatherers, humans learned to tame and breed animals. These pastoral communities valued all the cows but realized they do not need all the bulls to maintain numbers. Many bulls could be castrated and turned into beasts of burden pulling carts and plows. Could this apply to human society too? Not all males were necessary for reproduction. This is reinforced in the story of Nari Kavach, whose name means he who used women as a shield, found in Hindu Puranas. When Parshuram slaughtered all the Kshatriya men, only one man survived by hiding in the women's quarters. From this cunning coward sprang all the future Kshatriya clans. That a tribe needed women, not men, for its survival manifests in Stone Age art, where we find an obsession with fat, fertile female forms, or images of bejeweled women with their genitals exposed, while men are either reduced to the phallus or worshipped as the alpha bull, ram or goat. This is the same reason why, in the Bronze Age, we find images of groups of women worshipped alongside a single male. Similar thoughts gave rise to the yogini shrines found across India with just one male, the Bhairav, and the practice of Kanya Puja, which involves worshipping a group of young girls accompanied by a single boy in North India during Vasan Navratri or Spring Festival of the Goddess. A few anthropologists even argue that Krishna's Ras Leela may have its roots in old matriarchal tribes where the women valued only one male of the village. To get access to the women, men had to fight each other or simply submit to the woman's choice. This explains the origin of Swamvar, ceremonies described in the Hindu Puranas designed to get the best male for the woman. In such female-dominated cultures, the male could not refuse the woman. In the Mahabharat, when Arjuna refuses her advances, Urvashi curses him to turn into a eunuch. Any man who forced himself upon a woman was killed. In Greek mythology, Artemis turns Actaeon, the man who seeks to ravish her, into a stag that is ripped to pieces by his own hunting dogs. Anyone who attacked the man the woman chose would be put to death by other males. In Greek mythology, all the Greek warlords swear to protect the man Helen chooses as her husband. But there were always men eager to kill rivals and take their place as lovers. Greek mythology tells the story of Adonis, the boy lover of Aphrodite, goddess of love, who is killed by the more virile and jealous Mars, god of war. These tales hark back to a pre-patriarchal, matriarchal society. To ensure that the dominant males did not have exclusive and eternal rights to women, the ritual of killing the chosen males at regular intervals emerged. The chosen one came to her during the sowing season and he was sacrificed at harvest season. The woman had no say in the matter. She could choose her lover, but her choice was fatal. The triumph of the dominant male was in fact a march to death. So we find in Sumerian mythology, Inanna mourning for her lover Dumuzi who comes to her every spring but departs in winter. In the Rig Veda, there is a hymn where Urvashi's husband, Pururav, pines for her while she leaves him for the realm of the Gandharvs. The only way to survive being killed at the end of the term as king and consort of the goddess was by castrating oneself. And so, in the Near East, the priests of Saibel, called the Galli, ritually castrated themselves emulating Attis the castrated son or lover of the goddess. Some anthropologists trace similar thoughts to the practice of male priests dressing up as women and carrying pots during the worship of many Grama Devis, the village goddesses of India. We can speculate if the male heads around Kali's neck are the heads of men who were killed after they gave a child to the goddess of the tribe, an indicator of the price paid by the male sexual gaze. In Vaishnu Devi, the goddess is a virgin who kills the bhairav for approaching her sexually. But then, after beheading him, she asks her devotees to worship him too. We can only speculate if this can be traced to the ancient rejection or subjugation of the male sexual gaze. It was perhaps at this phase of human culture that the goddess came to be addressed as virgin mother. 
an ironical phrase it seems today for how can a virgin bear a child today a virgin is a woman who has never had sex but earlier it meant a woman who was ready to bear a child every woman then was a virgin between menstruations at the time of ovulation this virginity was restored after childbirth this thought informs a detail in the epic mahabharat where the heroine draupadi walks through fire to restore her virginity before she goes to the next husband we also find the virgin being referred to as a whore which means a prostitute this is a pejorative term today but long ago before the idea of property became the cornerstone of human culture it simply meant a woman who was free to go to any man she was like the earth that accepts seeds from all plants freely she was no field where the farmer controls the sowing and claims the harvest over time meanings changed and virgin became a word of praise while whore became an insult the shift in meaning reflects a shift from an older time when women were free to a later time when women were bound to men chapter 1 gaia's secret male anxiety is outdated part 2 chapter 1 gaia's secret male anxiety is outdated part 